Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Zoltan, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? I'm Zoltan Dinas. I'm at the University of Sussex in England. And um, my work is on um, conscious versus unconscious processes, consciousness in, um, in uh, hypnosis and how we can construct uh, subjective, conscious subjective experiences. Uh, a bit of mindfulness and then another area that i'm uh, involved in is reform in science how can we be doing science better when it comes to hypnosis can you explain a little bit about a little bit about the process of hypnosis involved with the conscious well the the interesting thing about hypnosis is the um the person can construct various illusions if you like um most people can experience this this particular uh, exercise or suggestion if i imagine my hands are like magnets and um, they're creating a force pulling my hands together so I, i'm creating in myself now I, I feel the force pulling my hands together so in reality it must have been me moving my hands together right there's no one else doing it it was me intending to move my hands together but it didn't feel like that it felt like my hands were moving by themselves so I created this experience of involuntariness in myself. Um, a, a person can also create um, <clears throat> hallucinations, so they can ex they can have uh, perceptual experiences of things that aren't there or portray things differently from, from what they are, um, or they can create what seem like delusions. Um, for example, you could. Um, you could have a suggestion or an exercise of uh, being a member of the the opposite sex and come to come to um, sort of suspend uh, uh, spend um, disbelief enough that in some ways it feels actually like that for you for some time so this in in our culture this is experienced in the context often of what we call hypnosis but that's just one context in which these these effects appear. Now, is there a reason why hypnosis works on some people and it doesn't work on others? Like, because I've seen like, you know, one of those Las Vegas, it's going to be a dumb example, but a Las Vegas show where they're like, they'll get a gangster up on stage and then they'll have the gangster like balking like a chicken or something like that. Now, mm -hmm. I understand some people are probably more malleable to it, but I, I, I'm curious as to what makes somebody susceptible to it and then unsusceptible to it. Yeah. I mean, one, one thing is motivation. If, if you really don't want it to happen, then typically nothing's going to happen. Um, so if you have sort of false beliefs about hypnosis that put you off it, that can stop you responding. Um, but when you when, when you sort of correct these these uh, correct the false beliefs in people and um, allow them to have positive attitudes, it's still true that not everyone can experience these suggestions and we don't really know why i mean that that remains one of the one of the mysteries that the the, the capacity to respond to suggestion in, in this way um is really stable uh it's been measured over like 25 year intervals and um it, it's it's highly reliable over that um that that time period but it correlates with pretty much nothing else to any worthwhile degree so any way you can know if you or someone else is going to respond to suggestions is really give some suggestions and and see how well you respond. Now, when it comes to just 
I mean, this field in general, how'd you get started into something like this? Like for me, every time I've ever had a discussion like this, it has been like the most like anxiety producing just because it's so hard because it necessarily doesn't have like, un like trying to understand consciousness. It doesn't have an exact answer. We still kind of don't know, but we have a lot of good ideas and a lot of good of understanding, but also there's still that we don't a lot that we don't understand. So me trying to get down to like, what is consciousness? Is, is it personality? Is it environmental influences? Is it, but it starts to realize that it seems like it just influences somebody's reality. Like what's interesting that you mentioned is like in certain like delusions or certain, you know, things people can hallucinate. I mean, does that lead to disorders as well too? Some people that have just, I don't know, severe paranoia or something where their reality just seems warped and it brings to this bigger pace this or this bigger space i would say of where i've kind of started understanding that everyone's living in their own reality which makes it really complicated to try and like you know work around people's different realities but i think from a large degree we all probably go by the same basis but there's little details that are a little bit different some people are maybe refusing authority some people are you know just different aspects of their personality that seem to influence their reality in a small part but in a larger scale um i gave you a lot i'm sorry <laughs> I, I was going to say something then i uh, um so the, the the question was um how'd you get started <laughs> how did i get started um actually i got started in hypnosis because i was i was interested in issues to do with attention and consciousness and I applied to do in, in my uh, first degree, which was in natural science uh, at Cambridge. And I, um, I was born in Australia. And I thought that I've been living in England um, the last uh, 10 years then. And I thought it'd be nice to go back to Australia. So I applied to do a, a master's at various places in Australia, including Macquarie University. And my supervisor, my assigned supervisor there was Kevin McConkey. He was a big hypnosis expert. And he said, well, um, if you want to work with me, you'll be on hypnosis. So I read a review paper on hypnosis and thought, well, this is really interesting. So I hypnotized over 100 people in the name of science for my thesis. That's a great way to say it. In the name of, how did you hypnose them? Like, was it hard? Was it difficult to get people to, did you like, you didn't dangle a pocket watch, did you? I'm sorry, I'm, my knowledge on hypnosis is so little. Yeah. Uh, no, in, in fact, learning how to hypnotize per se is, is extremely easy. Um, you could train someone to do that in half an hour. Uh, of course, using hypnosis in a practical way, uh, say clinically, you need a lot of training because what you really need is clinical skills. But le learning the hypnosis side of it is is very easy. Um, I then, um, I, I then after after that masters, I. I, I did a PhD on something else, namely implicit learning, which is our ability to um, unconsciously absorb, absorb information. But I came back to hypnosis later on when I realized the ideas I've been thinking about in terms of consciousness versus unconscious applied to hypnosis. And, and now that's hypnosis is back to being a sort of key part of, of um, my research. Um, there, was, there was something you were saying in, in your question. Um, I oh yeah, I but why? Why? I mean, you you, you raised the question of um, um, why on earth would it come about that we have this? You, I'm calling it an ability um, to to misrepresent how reality is. I mean, that sounds strange. I mean, don't don't we want to perceptually and otherwise represent reality as accurately as possible? So you know, wouldn't this wouldn't this go horribly wrong and uh, upset our lives? Uh, and I think the answer to that is um, the, the thing to bear in mind about when people create these experiences is it, the, the experiences are always in accordance with their goals. So, for example, um, one, one of the um, key researchers in hypnosis was was a chap called called uh, Nick Spanos, who was at Carleton University in Canada. He did, a, he did a lot of papers in the 80s and into the 90s, um, showing how, how the, the hypnotic response is, is very much in line with what the, what, 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 what the subject wants it to be. So to give an example of that, he had an experiment um, 
where subjects were told, whenever you hear the word experiment, you'll cough. You won't know why you're coughing. You just have an urge to cough. So this is called a post-hypnotic suggestion. And the question was, would this be a, uh, a, a compulsive need to cough in any context, even when it wasn't of any sort of benefit to the subject? So the subjects were told in the next 48 hours, you'll cough whenever you hear the word experiment. And then the, the subjects were intercepted in that period by um, collaborators of the experimenter who, who asked about where some psychology experiment was. Now, none of the subjects coughed in that context. But when they were back in with the hypnotist again, 48 hours later, they did cough when the hypnotist gave the cue. So the, the, the response was sensitive to uh, whether it was appropriate for it to be given or not. It, it wasn't just given automatically and beyond the person's control. Uh, and that doesn't mean they're faking, by the way, because there's also evidence that they're not faking. It was, it was goal-directed, but not faking. It was a compelling subjective experience, but in accordance with the needs and goals of the subject. Uh, another way of showing this is uh, an experiment done before ethics committees were around uh, in which um, subjects were, students were hypnotized uh, and, and told in the future, whenever you hear the word, uh, you are now hypnotized, you'll be hypnotized. And the experimenter then agrees to meet them by the library later on. Half of the subjects are told, now you're hypnotized. And then they're asked to help him with a drug deal. And the other half are asked without the hypnosis. Now we know that the, uh, the subjects took this seriously because one subject attempted to beat up the experimenter and another one, uh, the, the parents of another one wrote a very sort of rude letter to the experiment about how dare you get my, my child involved with, with drugs. So the, the experiment was compellingly enacted, as it were. And a third of the subjects went through with the, the drug deal, which involved taking some white powder to an apartment, getting some money, giving it to the experiment. Um, but the thing is, a third of them went through with it in the non-hypnotized condition as well. And those who did it said, yeah, I got no problem with drugs. You want to do drugs, let's do some drugs. And the ones who didn't do it said, I'm really, you know, they said that it was against their moral code to do drugs. So while that experiment probably would be uh, really hard to get past ethics these days, this was done around about 1970, it was, it was a good job it was done because it shows if you, if you give people a hypnotic suggestion to do something that's against their moral principles, then they tend not to do it. So e even though the hypnotic response feels compelling to the subject, and some subjects believe they'll do it, do anything they're asked to. In fact, they won't. They are ultimately in control. They won't do something that's against the principles. And uh, indeed, the first study I talked about showed that they won't even do the suggestion if it doesn't seem quite appropriate to do it. They only do it when it uh, fits in with their, their goals. Maybe in, in the case of the experiment, it was the goal to be a good hypnotized subject. What about if someone doesn't have any morals or any codes, I would say, like someone that doesn't know that this is wrong or this is this, they just don't have an understanding of that. I think that's the whole point of like experience is that either if you don't have parents that instill some type of basic knowledge of you can't kill people, you can't do this and you can't do that. But there are some people, obviously, they don't have that experience. They don't have parents that could teach them don't touch a light bulb or something like that. And they don't know. And so they end up learning it. So part of it's kind of linked in with memory. I mean, we know from doing something and it goes wrong, we probably won't end up doing it a second time. But also it builds up like these walls or these preconceived notions, I would say. So if you ask someone to go do a drug deal without hypnotizing them, if they don't have any problem with drugs is because they don't know maybe that this is highly illegal or this is it's not stigmatized to them. So it just seems like you're just delivering newspapers, which we commonly do every single day. Yeah. So, I mean, for those 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 people, if you, you could you could probably request them to do various um, antisocial acts or uh, and, and that would be quite might be quite happy to do them if there was something in it for them. In the same way, you give them a hypnotic suggestion to do it and they'll probably if they think 
if they want to go go along with being hypnotized they'll they'll experience it as a hypnotic suggestion that's right so the sort of the more sociopathic people would do more um or those who thought that the act wasn't dangerous to themselves or others who thought it was okay they would go through with the hypnotic suggestion to do it just as they'll go through with their requests to do it uh, without hypnosis being involved do you agree that there are some experiences that are okay that are some mistakes but then there's larger ones that are more serious like for instance like you know when you go to a friend's house when you're a kid and you realize that not everybody's family eats the same you have your different experience or like some family only eats meat you might only eat fish that's weird but you get used to it and you're like okay i guess this is what we have to do over here but then there's obviously larger kind of confusions on people's experiences which is like if some drugs for instance someone's not normalized to doing drugs i mean our routines for instance smoking cigarettes for one person smoking a pack a day is normal to another person it's like holy crap and it's those experiences where there's large ones that will make a comment at, or there's large ones that come off to us sometimes as red flags, but then there's other experiences, which are just subtle differences. Like if you go to order a Coke at a restaurant they say they only have Pepsi products, you don't make a statement about it. You don't really make a big deal about it. You kind of just go, okay, then give me a Pepsi. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some things we think are genuine sort of moral red lines, uh, ethical principles we don't violate um you know if uh, there's some cultural differences but if someone says um we do um um uh, what's it called a, a, a genital mutilation of of uh, females female genital mut mutilation uh i would say that's you know you've got to stop that I'm, I'm not a i'm not a moral relativist in the sense we just allow them to do it when uh, it, it it overall increases the amount of human suffering and misery. Yeah. So like you're saying, I have some things I think just shouldn't be done and other things I say, fine, if you want to be that way, then you be that way. How difficult does this play to get it? I mean, because if you look at the world, the weight of the world, besides different cultures, I say take the states for example or just take one country in general the basic principles of law or the basic principles of decisions of what's right and wrong is an overall broadband template. Like everyone kind of abides by, we know this is right and we know this is wrong, which makes it extremely complicated if you're rule setting, because then you look at an example of like, let's take one country compared to, if I go to another country, I don't know, driving on the left side of the road is not normal in the United States, but it might be in the UK or might be somewhere else, which you end up making an error and you have to correct yourself. And I think it makes it twice as interesting because it's like well how are you ingraining rules and then how long do those rules take to be ingrained until someone ends up you know adapting to them you know how quickly is your mind able to form to realize now this is the correct way and everything that i've been told which would be wrong is now wrong and now this is now the right way yeah some some rules are, i mean left and right you just say well that's arbitrary i'm not going to make a fuss about that i'll try and break my habit um driving in a country that does it differently other rules might be slightly more borderline and you have to adjust um, maybe slightly slower, like whether you queue or not. So if you're all going to get something and and you're used to queuing and then you come across people who don't queue, that you just sort of they just sort of push in and so on. Wait, what's queuing? Uh, queuing, yes. So this is the, the British. <laughs> you said <laughs> it. I was British like, what? Queuing. Uh, queuing means... Um, Let's say you're waiting for the bus. First person there is in first position. Second person is in second position. Third person's third position. You go in, in an orderly manner. If you're if you go into a shop and buying something, you form a queue. First person there is in the front of the queue, then the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. A so line. I got you. Yeah, you call it a line. Okay. Um, and so you know, it's a it's it's meant to be a principle of fairness. So in Britain, if someone pushes in in front of the queue, that is horrendous. Uh, you don't do that. I mean, some people do, um, but it's regarded as very bad indeed. Whereas there are, there are other, other cultures where, you know, what's the big deal? It doesn't, it doesn't matter that much. In fact, social rules is, is one situation where um, you get, talking about conscious, unconscious, where you, you do get con conscious and unconscious. Um, knowledge about how you should behave so this relates very much to uh, what you're talking about for example in 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 england um 
we have this rule that you should queue. Uh, but English should also sort of stiff up a lip in some way. So if someone pushes in in the queue, people will half and puff. <sighs> but if they'll find it very hard to tell the person, you know, what a bastard they are pushing in in front. Someone might do it, but a lot of people find it very hard. You just don't do that sort of thing. You just follow the queue. If you break the rule, it's very difficult to, to then tell someone off about it. So that's sort of uh, a set of English sort of cultural rules about how to behave. Also in our um, in our pubs, um, you go to the you go to the bar to be served. You, you don't have the bartender come up to you. You go you go to the front. So the bartender has to remember the queue, the order in which you serve people. And it's Britain, right? It's England. So you have to. There must be a queue, and you must serve the people in the right order. But people don't make an orderly line in the pub. You will go to the front of the bar. And the bartender has to keep in mind who's first, who's next, who's next, who's next. Now, you, um, you're allowed to help the bartender out by indicating it's your turn. You, you can go like this, you know, something subtle. But what you must never do, and this was pointed out in a book by an anth anthropologist, anthropologist Kate Fox, in Watching the English, you never lift your elbow off the bar like that and make a big motion. That would be, that's just. You just don't do that. Because that's rude, right? Because then you'd be like raising your hand, like, hey, pay attention to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I read this and I thought, yeah, when I was in, in a pub, I, I, I might go like that. I might make a small motion. I'd never make, say, it's my turn next. I'd never do that. I thought, but I'd never reflected on that. I'd never thought about that. I never knew that as a conscious rule. I'd never even think of, I'd never think of telling anyone who knew to the country, you know, when, when, you, when you go up there, remember your line in the queue, you can indicate move your glass a bit if you really have a glass or something like that but for god's sake don't lift your elbow off the, off the uh, table i'd never think of that so that was that, that's that was the implicit knowledge that wasn't one of the conscious uh rules of socializing that i had but w when when kate fox wrote in this book i said yes of course i thought to myself of course that's that's right another example of um unconscious social knowledge i came across is the um the allowed distance between two people which varies by culture. So in a given culture, you, when you stand opposite someone <clears throat> and, and you just talk, there's a particular distance that's maximally comfortable for that culture. Now, I, I remember once going on a, on a train in Greece and I started talking to this guy, I think he was Arabic, and we're on, the train was pretty empty and we we're on one side of the carriage and there was sort of a long, a long seat. I realized coming on some time later, we'd shifted right to the other side and I was leaning back and he was, talking to me I thought how the hell did I get over here and what had happened was uh, he he was adjusting to the comfortable distance of his culture and I was readjusting to the, the 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 British cultural distance and so we did this very slow minute dance across the uh the uh the, the train as, as, as we were talking but this was all quite implicit I, I I never consciously tried to apply any rule I didn't even know what had happened until I reflected on it so half an hour later. Do you think that the, I would say the conscious and the unconscious play a bigger role in a personal perspective, or do you think it plays bigger in a societal perspective? Because I've always been thinking of it as a personal thing. Like I know unconsciously I'm doing, or subconsciously I'm doing something, like tapping my foot. Right now I'm tapping my foot. I have ADHD. I've always tapped my feet and I've just never paid attention to it. It just always happens. So someone will yell at me or slap me in the back of the head. But then there's conscious decisions that I'm making, which I'm trying to do with the words that I choose. But a lot of times I'm, you know, focusing more like if you're driving or something, you're consciously focusing on you have to make a turn signal or you have to hit the gas, you have to hit the brake. But then if you take it into the big perspective of just society, a line is a good example. Now we just line up because we know that's what we're supposed to do. And it's just reactionary. It's not, some people might cut the line and then you get the, you know, the exhales and you get the people that might be passively aggressive by, hey, you know, trying to say like, hey, you shouldn't cut the line or just seem frustrated. So maybe this person starts becoming more aware. But then you have obviously people that'll that'll mention something. But that's something we do every single day when we start realizing, does it play a bigger role in society? We've just in been ingrained with rules or manners, I would say. You say please and thank you. You say goodbye. You say hello. These are things you don't even think about doing unless you're like maybe meeting a girl for the first time and you're trying to think of like a cool like one liner you know, to open up the door to conversation, but 
most of the time you're reaction or you're, you're reactionary, I guess, in the state of just, I wouldn't say being, but the state of at least the world. I mean, most people when they're interacting with someone in public, which made it extremely difficult because how many people during this pandemic, you, you were at home the whole time, you couldn't go anywhere. And that's when I talked about, did people lose their common sense? Well, no, people been inside of their house the whole time. So you had people that were walking across the street without looking both ways, which is a normal thing you would have done. But it's not, it's like, it's kind of like a muscle. If you're not used to going out into the world and experiencing it, you're going to forget some of the basic functions of just how the world works without getting you know hit by a car or, you know, basic functions. It, we, we see it when we drive as well, too. People just unconsciously or just I, I wouldn't say consciously because they don't seem like they're paying attention on it but they might cut somebody off on accident because they're paying attention to something else and then you get road rage road rage isn't normal it's like this one weird moment in all of our lives where i think we all experience road rage but we get we're, we're, we go from zero to ten so quickly and so fast where it's like what is happening in that time period you know so you start realizing it plays a bigger role in society and how we function than it does at least in my opinion in our personal yeah, I mean, then uh, anyone who sort of tried to stay in another country for some time with, with different different culture, you um, you realize things feel differently. Um, so, that, and sometimes it's hard to put your finger on every, every, everything that's different. So, certainly, the the whole how you operate in the culture, the sort of rules I've been talking about, um, are guiding our behavior all the time. What one thing happened to me? I went to China every year for about ten years to. Uh, work at East China Normal University and um, Institute of Psychology in Beijing and um, I used to take my then teenage son with me so we we went my Shanghai hosts were looking after me and um, at the, the the end of a, a lunch both me and my son realized we were utterly utterly stuffed we couldn't we couldn't eat anymore we didn't want to eat anymore and we weren't looking forward to dinner because we'd just been so stuffed and finally dawned on me what had happened. It was, it was one of these, these sort of uh, cultural mismatches. So in um, in England, we have the rule, uh, when someone's a host for you at a meal, make sure you eat all, all the food. Make sure that the plate is clean. Otherwise, you're saying you don't like the food. And they kept feeding you because you thought you were still hungry. And then they... You yeah, but China, really the rule is, if the plate is clean, you're a really bad host. You must put more food on the plate. So what they were doing is I was cleaning my plate, and so was my son Harry. And then they put more food on. It. I thought, oh my god, I have to eat this food to be. You know, I wasn't thinking it through completely explicitly, but in, in essence, I was thinking in order to be a good guest, I've got to clean my plate. And they were thinking in order to be a good host, we've got to make sure his food left on the plate. So, um, and it takes some. It took well, it took me one meal to realise <laughs> what was going on. Um, yeah, so we have all these sort of implicit rules um, that guide us. I mean, that those particular rules may have been learned explicitly at some point. So some rules you are told as children, and as you're growing up, these are the rules, and you learn them, and then they, they come to guide you without thinking about it. Other rules you were never told. Uh, you just pick them up unconsciously, a process called implicit learning, by, whereby we can absorb regularities without ever consciously knowing um, what they are. Um, Distancing is probably one. I don't think I was ever told what the correct distance is. distancing is. You're just experiencing, you just experience lots of, dis, you know, episodes of having a certain distance on a certain person and people adjusting to you as a kid until you take it on. And uh, and then that just becomes something you've learned without even thinking about it. A, a really good example of ab absorbing information without ever consciously knowing it is knowing the rules of grammar of your native language. So five-year-olds basically know all the major rules of grammar. In the sense, you look at how their speech is constructed and what they understand, they understand the rules of their native language. Uh, but they have no conscious knowledge of those rules. I mean, probably their parents had not the slightest conscious knowledge of the rules. I mean, if they thought they knew some grammar, they might know what a noun and a verb is and a few rules about that. But those are th those rules you learn in school are utterly simplistic. What we what we use as users of language is something far more complex uh, than is is in the grammar books, and we absorb them as young children, so that within a few years we had mastered uh, we had mastered those regularities. In fact, no linguist has a complete grammar of any natural language. 
but our brains unconsciously absorbed these rules in, in the matter of a, of a few years. So that that's uh, so um, the unconscious knowledge we have shows up in all sorts of situations. So we talked about um, socializing, social rules, also uh, language, uh, how you how you can speak fluently, understand fluently something so utterly complex as a natural language. Does I mean, does it influence everything consciously and then kind of unconsciously as well, too? Because your example with just changing of words or just grammar in general, language changes all the time. I mean, it's relatively over a little bit of a time period. But if you take an example like a younger generation using the words lit and using all these types of things, you unconsciously pick it up. But then if you're depending on, I guess, what your age range would be as well, too, if you're not a hip grandparent and you're trying to understand what your kids are saying, you're going to make a conscious decision to try and understand what these words are and also be able to use the language, too, to be able to connect. So you start realizing, OK, does that mean every single thing has obviously it's going to have a conscious decision and then I would say an unconscious decision. But how much does it influence? And you realize it's like a balanced scale. It's kind of a back and forth. It really just varies on the person. Yeah, I think we're, we're constantly refining the meaning we attach to words. Um, e e even in sort of uh, older people, uh, I mean, they can be relatively set in the way they use words, but words changing all the time. And uh, the way I use words now, I've, I've noticed is different from, say, 10 years ago. Um, it's true, the younger people will pick up on the newest words a lot more quickly um and so there's sort of a bit of a generational mismatch but the unconscious learning goes on all the time constantly refining how you use words uh and and grammatical constructions um as you say one can consciously also take on board information and have that guide you as well and that's a debate in second language learning um so okay first language you do it almost all unconsciously purely unconsciously but now second language learning how should that be? Should you tell people the grammatical rules or do you just sort of dump them, immerse them in the middle of uh, the language environment and just say, try and deal with it and let your brain sort it out? Pendulum swim, swings back and forth on the, exactly the right balance. And probably the right balance is different for different people uh, in that case. Are there ever certain categories where it just I guess, ways in one side, like there's only certain times that you'll always will make conscious decisions when it comes to a certain topic. And then there's probably another era where there's only times you'll make unconscious decisions like breathing. That's a hundred percent, probably unconscious most of the time, unless you're doing a heavy cardio activity or something that requires you to, someone's telling you to take in breaths. But then if you examine something that's only a conscious decision, that's like a game like Simon says. You're consciously being aware because you're told and ahead of time. The rules of the game is you have to make sure that before you make a move, you hear Simon says beforehand or you'll be out. Yeah, conscious. What you have to do consciously is if you want to break a habit, that has to be done consciously. So that's why Simon says works because you have you have the habit of responding to the instruction to do something, but you can't just go with your habit. You have to make sure it was it was said in the said, said in the right way. Um, if you normally drove a certain way to work, um, but you wanted to turn off a slightly different route to go to the shop on the on the way to work, um, that's breaking habit, and you would have to be consciously thinking of that intention at the right juncture uh, in order to do it. So break breaking habit. Or doing something entirely novel, complex and entirely novel, that has to be conscious as well. Uh, unconscious learning sort of gradually fine tunes and um, builds up habits. Whereas um, what you can do consciously is to come up with something novel, complex and novel, all in one go, uh, and and overcome habit. So they yeah they play different roles in our lives in in, in that way. Can I ask which, which you would prefer? Would you prefer to make conscious decisions all the time or would you prefer to make unconscious decisions all the time? Because like I'm the type that seems like I like unconscious decisions. I think that's probably why I stay at my job because I get used to it. And it's like a routine, why people like their routines because most of the time you can do it 100% on autopilot without having to focus into it. If, if it came to something like learning a language, I'd want it to be unconscious. I want it consciously thinking of the grammar of the language hang on i'm going to swap that one around hang on i'm going to do that 
that is painful and slow and you've lost the conversation um so yeah some things you definitely want to be unconscious um movements uh like developing new um physical skills like in a sport you want that ultimately to be unconscious as well because there's the the phenomenon of choking whereby if you think of something too consciously like how am i doing this how am i doing this movement um you choke or you you you, you bungle it basically um so I and mean, then that can be that can be a way that some sports people have upset other sports people uh, in a sort of deliberate Machiavellian way. They say, oh, what was your elbow doing during that swing? Uh, and just walk off and watch them bungle the swing. Oh, trash talk or psyching somebody out. But yeah, that... but it looks like you're being not trash talking. You're just, you're just being curious or helpful. Um, but that yeah. leads into a whole other category of words. Then, if we talk about the conscious and the unconscious, then you just examine reactionary and the thinkers in our society. There are people that think way too much on making a step, and then you know, people like in sports, for instance, a lot of the time it's just reactionary. You know, if you're going to catch a ball, you don't know what your legs are doing. You're not thinking to jump and catch this thing. You're thinking, I got to catch this, and it's going to be any way I possibly can. Yeah, catching a ball is something else I've worked on. There's a very specific algorithm the brain follows to get you to the right place at the right time to intercept that ball. But people have no conscious idea what that rule is. Um, they come up with rules for catching balls that are completely false and, and would guarantee their failure to catch the ball if they ever try to do what they consciously think they're doing. So yeah, there's certain perceptual motor skills uh, that are done purely purely unconsciously and we wanted to be that way because we wanted to happen so quickly uh and and um change over time so so uh, so quickly as events change over time like catching the ball um that there's no time for conscious thinking we would have keep that out of the equation how close does the fight or flight model play into the conscious and the unconscious decisions i mean fight fight or flight is to do with emotions um the causes of emotions can be unknown so that's an issue when we in terms of conscious versus unconscious why do i have this emotion uh and often we don't know or we misattribute the cause of the emotion um so that that certainly comes into it um some people have argued whether emotions themselves can be unconscious could you be happy and not know it um you can be aroused without knowing it yeah exactly so i i think i think so i i yeah exactly so i think you could you could that was have a dirty a example i'm sorry <laughs> well there's an interest there was an interesting study about that done in the uh, in the 90s by adams et al um i don't know if you've heard of a trathismograph which you probably haven't no it's a um um it's a it's a sort of a a rubber band type of thing but it has a electrical conductivity that changes with, with how much it's stretched or not so you can put it around a uh, male penis and um, then measure how how erect they are so what this study did was to have men who said they were heterosexual uh, watch erotic videos and they also measured how homophobic the men were now, all the men, when they watched um, heterosexual videos, the plethysmograph showed they were getting aroused. Now, the interesting thing is when they played them homoerotic videos. Now, the, the homophobic men became really pretty aroused by it. They, the the plethysmograph showed half the growth, fully half the growth, as they got with the heterosexual videos. Um, so possibly what's going on there i don't know if it's, this isn't the only answer but it could be that that was unconscious arousal right that the, these men said well i'm purely straight but clearly they they weren't so is that because they they were aroused by other men and just were not aware of it uh that's possible we don't know that for sure because it could be that they they knew they were aroused but were ashamed of it didn't like it or something like that or just publicly didn't want to admit it but it but it's certainly possible that there was 
it was unconscious about us with that. Unless you like that senator that tried to ban gay marriage and he went to his gay son's wedding and it was just like, what? Like, <laughs> that's 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 weird. But that's what that's what the kind of like the stereotype is. It usually a lot of times that people, you know, they're so anti something they're usually probably because they're hiding like a secret something for that. And I mean, that's just difficult. Though. I mean, I, I don't know what people like. People like all different types of things. And it starts going into like, why am I attracted to the things I'm attracted to? I'm not thinking a whole lot about it. It's just there's certain people that I find attractive and there's certain people that I don't. We don't know the causes of that. We just know the attraction. That's, that's, right. that's crazy because that's been happening for the longest time. I think we've been a species and no. <laughs> what is the answer to that? I mean, that brings into a bigger question. Is it more of a modern day influence when it comes to the unconscious and conscious? Or is it more of like this has always been here? We've always made decisions. I feel like we put terms on th- like I've I have ADHD where I find most of my time to be the best time for me to do anything is when nobody is awake, middle of the night, being those night owl types. And I go, we've just labeled it with different language. It's this, it, this is the topic is it, did I just make a conscious decision to be up when no one's around or after years of just being up when nobody's up and enjoying that better, I'm now making the unconscious decision to make sure I plan my whole day around that. It's not weird that I plan my day to sleep when everyone else is awake and moving around and then i plan to be awake when no, i'm just i just that's my routine now and i realize that we're just boiling down our words into different terminologies they're really the, the same basic distinction which boils on to whatever makes your experience or your reality one that best fits what you want yeah yeah, our, our sleep-wake cycle, I think we only have limited control. Over. I, I'm a morning person. I get up early and I get really tired uh, in the evening. I don't have any control over that. Other people want to get up late and go to bed late. They don't have a whole lot of control over that either. Um, yeah, so that's those are the sort of arousal rhythms of the body that aren't consciously controlled. I mean, we can push them around a little bit, but uh, not, 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 not too much. In, in terms of uh, being a modern thing, I think, um, I mean, language goes back, well, we don't know how long, probably several hundred thousand years, um, maybe longer. And, um, you know, there's one of your prime unconscious processes, learning the grammar of, of a language that's been around hundreds of thousands of years, uh, and then enables, language is what enables some of the most glorious conscious achievements. So that sort of um, uh, uh, sort of dichotomy between the conscious and the unconscious goes back uh, a long way. Of course, we've been catching things, or, or the reverse skill is avoiding something thrown at us, which is probably evolutionarily where our skill to catch balls came from. It was to know where not to be in order not to get hit by something. You reverse that in order to intercept something. I mean, that is so basic. I'm sure that's been around a long, long, long time. Um, probably before, way before we were even human. Um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is if we still really kind of have a, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say no beginning on understanding of conscious and unconscious, but we have an understanding of it. We just don't know the full capabilities of what that could exceed to is probably a better thing for it but we also have an understanding of what can manipulate consciousness even though we haven't even fully figured out what that word is yet we've already found ways hypnosis drugs can alter our consciousness and unconsciousness um dreams we don't know what happens are are we unconscious but we can also be kind of conscious if we can remember our dreams right so we must be dreams conscious experiences while we are we appear we are as creatures unconscious because we're asleep Yes, yeah, so the word conscious has several meanings. One of them is refers to you as a creature. Are you conscious or not? So asleep or awake, not doubt or awake. But a separate meaning is of a given mental state. Is that mental state conscious or not? So when, when you're dreaming, you're as a creature unconscious, but you have a conscious mental state, namely seems to you as if you're seeing and experiencing all these things that are happening in your dream, and that's a conscious experience, while you are as a creature unconscious. It's like people in comas. Yeah, now people in comas, um, people are fully in a coma. We can't detect anything going on. Then as they come out, or hopefully 
uh, they come out, but with the people who do, they, the next level up is called vegetative state or unresponsive waking syndrome. And that's when the person um, seems to have various cycles, like sleep and awake, in terms of what the body's doing, but you, you can't detect anybody at home. They don't respond to calling the name, uh, any commands. They don't seem to focus on anything. It's just the body going through certain phases of arousal, but, but nothing else is, is going on. Um, then if they're going to come out of it some more, they get into a sort of a minimally conscious state where it seems they have moments of lucidity where they can react to the name or focus on something and so on. And, and then hopefully they, they, they come out of it. Now, it turned out some, some patients that were classified as vegetative state where the thought was they're having no unconscious, they were having no conscious experiences. Um, it turned out that some of those were indeed having conscious experiences. They just couldn't express them. They couldn't control the body to, to do anything to express it. And the, the way um, we found this out, well, uh, Owen did, who was at Cambridge and is now um, in Canada, he put them in an fMRI scanner. So an fMRI scanner measures the, the blood flow in different parts of the brain so you can see which bits of the brain are working. So he could say to them, um, imagine you're playing tennis. Now, if you say this to, to uh, sort of normal people, part of the brain lights up um, to do with um, movement. And if you say, imagine going around your house, then a part of the brain lights up to do with uh, coding space, spatial relationships where you are in space. So with, with normal people, you can tell which one they're imagining by which bits of the brain light up. I, is it uh, movement related or is it um, spatial encoding? So he asked um, patients apparently in vegetative state, imagine, imagine going about your house or imagine playing tennis. And um, he found for some of those patients, the corresponding bits of the brain was lighting up. So these people were imagining what they're being asked to imagine. So they must have been having conscious experiences, even though there was no other way of detecting it because they couldn't move their eyes or their, um, their mouth to say anything or their hands to indicate anything. Uh, there's no way they could communicate with the outside world, but we know there was something going on. They were having conscious experiences. Is there a way to be able to, I mean, if we're able to measure at least certain parts of the brains, EKGs, brain scans, whichever you want to say, to be able just to pay attention to see what parts of the brain are lighting up, is there a way to be able to reactivate consciousness in the more physical form? Like in a sense, if you have somebody in a coma, I know it's a different route than probably what you're more focused into, but if you have somebody in a coma and they're still processing the information going on, so their ears are obviously still working, they can hear everything that you're saying, but they're not able to physically react to what you are saying, or you need a machine to be able to pick that up. Is there a way to somehow impulse it? I mean, we figured out lobotomies to fix, I mean, if, depending on what side you lean on lobotomies, it did some, it did what it was intended to do, which was try and fix what they thought was, you know, obsessive behaviors and things of that sort. But if we have a way to awaken the consciousness in a sense of being able to forcibly get someone to react out of the coma, like we don't know what causes people to get out of them. It could be a smell. It could be a sound. It could be something, but it, 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 it probably involves more, I would say to that person's emotional connection, which would ever brings them out of it, which makes me wonder, is there a way to be able to target what that would be? If we see the impulses in the brain, could we just try and find a way to activate it in a sense to make it more physical, at least to where they can open their eyes. I mean, you got people with Lou Gehrig's disease or something that literally their body becomes a prison and then they're just, they're trapped. They're mute. They have to use their eyes to talk in a sense. I mean, there's, I, I would hope that there's at least a technology to be able to manipulate it as such to be able to at least pull it more into a physical form. Yeah. I mean, there is some deep brain stimulation, but you have to cut open the skull, put electrodes in, and that has been used to try and treat some conditions. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not aware of it having been used in um, to get people out of coma. Could have been. I mean, clearly it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty invasive operation. You need consent. Uh, yeah you got to go in like inception where you jump into his dream and be like hey man you mind if we chop half of your scalp off and just you know test something yeah i mean maybe you wouldn't do it 
it's not my area, so I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't do it with someone in coma, but, but you want the person to be awake when you're doing it. So you you make sure as you're going down with the electrode, you're not you're not cutting up neurons that um, you don't want to be uh, mucking around with. Um, so I don't I don't know how you bring people out of coma. Well, a better question is: Do you ever think that we really lose consciousness entirely? I know people that have been knocked out, but they can be quick smell and next you know they're up i don't think you're you really are never fully losing consciousness until you're dead until you know they pronounce like no vital life signs because i think you know someone taps you and you're sleeping you're awake um you know you pay attention why'd you hit me or why'd you wake me up or if someone gets cut while they're in a coma i've seen people get hurt or something happens when they're in a coma and it's just enough that can cause them to get out of it in a sense as well too Bear in mind, under, under general anesthesia, you cut wide open, and um, you can be, and you don't wake up. So, I mean, under general, general anesthesia, or, or even when you're in very deep sleep, um, it's hard to know, was there no consciousness going on at all? Was it literally zilch? Um, or were there, was there sort of some sort of minimal conscious state that was that was going on moment to moment it's a bit hard to say i mean my guess would be in general anesthesia you when someone's deep in there you've you just stop consciousness for that for that period of time until you wake them up is that different from using hypnosis to have someone go into um under the knife or something yeah now when you when we using hypnosis is the greek word for sleep so when a doctor talks about hypnotic he talks he means something that a drug that puts you to sleep so using hypnosis in the term we're using it before as a as a sort of a form of suggestion that that doesn't put you out so you lose consciousness no it doesn't do that um hyp hypnosis is um but it can be used in operations but in order to control the anxiety and the pain not to knock you out um so some people can have major surgery say cesarean section um using hypnotic suggestion as the only form of analgesia um but they're not knocked out i mean in fact, that's one of the advantages of of using hypnotic pain control is the person is with it uh and uh um you can do the operation and and if, if they're really good uh, hypnotic subject they'll be fine and then you don't need to i mean general anesthesia is quite a assault on the whole whole on the whole body it's a torch the fields do. method mm -hmm. it's a torch the fields method we're just like hey we just got to knock them out that's the whole point oh the whole point of surgery you just, surgery you give, yes if you're giving them a medicine you just like give them this and it's like well are you sure it's going to knock them out well that's the point we don't want them being away yeah, from exactly this. yeah exactly yeah yeah if I, if I had to ask you to gauge on a percentage bar what do you think our daily activities are just our daily i mean everything just breathing all that would you put consciousness decisions like i would probably put it like 15 or 20 percent you know, you, you ever see the movie Lucy where she takes that drug and her brain apparently opens up to where she can use the full capacity of her brain. They say you use like 20% or something like that. I'm, I'm gauging it from that. Like, I feel like you use your whole brain, but most of your decisions that you make on a daily basis are probably unconscious decisions. Um, your brain's probably a large scale of it is unconscious decisions compared to the stuff that you do logically think about or you do make conscious decisions or being aware of. Yeah, I don't want to give a percentage on that because I think it's always, it always sort of almost always just involves both and you, and you can't have one without the other. I mean, we, we use language often, but we don't have to. But we often use language to think about problems consciously. But when we're using language, we're using a whole lot of unconscious machi machinery as we've been talking about. E even the way we've absorbed the meaning of words is done largely unconsciously. The way we the rules by which we string those words together to make meaning that's that's done unconsciously but then we but we need that unconscious machinery in order to think consciously so so both have to be happening at the same time and the only reason we can think consciously is the whole bunch of machinery underneath it that we don't know about that's powering our our, our conscious mind I, I mean i suspect a lot of people in a sense you don't use all of your brain power as it were um 
I mean, a lot of people will have um, distractions and maybe ruminations, things they're worried, things they're worried about. And if they're a bit more mindful, maybe they can concentrate more on, on certain things. Um, and then they could, it would seem as if they're using more conscious brain power on, on, on a problem. Well, you find it easier to be able to be more conscious when you're looking at the past rather than when you're looking at the future. Like saying, make sure you're thinking for the future. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen, but if you're examining events of the past, for instance, if we take your, you know, the example of when you went to China, you probably were looking back at that like, oh, it was just a miscommunication thing. But obviously you don't want to be rude and say I'm full and be, you know, a bad or a bad, you know, visitor. But then to them, it was the opposite where they were like, that means they're a bad host. See, that's something it takes a little bit. And if you don't say anything, which most people wouldn't say anything, and they would just keep it going back and forth for a while until finally they figured it out, like, hey, we have to leave. I don't want to be fed anymore. That, But you look back at that and you examine that incident as you realize, okay, those were just unconscious decisions of not trying to be rude. But then you can examine it consciously and realize next time I'm in another culture, I can explain that, no, I'm good for now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the conscious insight came after the, the fact, as it were, it does take some time for us to consciously work things out. You're right. So when we think about the past, often the best analysis of it is going to take some time. Um, yes, that's true. Well, the realization of hindsight is easier than foresight. Yeah, which, exactly. That's what I, that's what I find fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Do you ever try and consciously think of things that you can affect like if it's in, obviously you can think of like, you know, making sure your house is clean and things of that sort, but trying to make sure that like, you're like goal setting. I mean, how much of that really relies on your conscious aspect of what you want? I've heard so many people try and set goals. And I know it's a thing, at least in my generation, it seems like a lot newer of like, make sure your goals are lined up. You got to do everything that you possibly can to make your goals. But unconsciously, it's like, you don't really have a flow of where that goes you know someone could just pluck you up out of obscurity and make you into something where your whole life would change and that's not anything that really relies on you and it goes into this bigger aspect i think we've hinted at it a couple of times which is willing it into the universe that's a big thing where i go well if you're thinking about it 24 7 unconsciously thinking about it you're just evolved around it you're ending, you're ending up going to force it into existence it's not like you're just conjuring something out of magic but if you, if you ask me like hey don't drop this and you say it to me 10 times i'm gonna end up dropping it and it's just gonna be like what the like i was consciously paying attention not to drop it but you just said it so much my body reacted in a different way Yes, we can certainly overthink things. Um, there have been studies on that. If you get people to think about the problem too much, um, they find it harder to solve the problem. They come, they come to worse solutions. That, that, it was, that was often, that had been used, as what people thought was going on is we unconsciously solved the problem. But often what, what looks like unconsciously solving the problem is actually consciously solving it, but not thinking about it too much. Um, to make sure we we don't get um, uh, buried down some little rabbit hole of thinking where we just get get stuck down. So, you know, often we solve problems best when we're going for a walk, getting on the bus. Um, we're taking a break from the problem. That's when, and, and I think the reason for that, well, what, what, one idea was that it's unconscious problem solving. But another sort of, I think, more simple idea, which was put forward by Herbert Simon, who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, um, was that um, when you take a break and then you just sort of absentmindedly come back to the problem as, you, as you're going for a walk, you suddenly see the bigger prick picture. And so you see a different route to solving it. Whereas before, when you were thinking about it really hard, you got lost down one little route, which happened to be a dead end. So um, what, might you, what you might experience as unconscious solution of something might just be um, making sure you don't overthink. It doesn't take a break. Doesn't that, really, doesn't, see that, different. doesn't that relate to the ideology of just today where it's living in the moment? Like I find that with periods of isolation or prolonged, a lot of people like to be alone. I like isolation. Um, you know, I, I don't always want to do conversations and stuff like that, but those times of isolations are times where I'm more conscious on decisions in my own head. You know, it's getting stuck up in your own head, for instance, and thinking, overthinking sometimes about a lot of decisions you make. That's more difficult when there's a crap ton of people around you and you're basically still trying to 
be awake and functioning, not on autopilot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, each person needs to find their, their own balance of um, how much you need to be by yourself and how much you need to be to be in other company. I, I certainly have a balance of that. If too much of one, I, 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 I need the other. Are there any emotions that probably react more to different states like conscious and unconscious? I feel like anger would be the best example of an unconscious, probably, brain state. You're not consciously paying attention to your anger. You're consciously only paying attention to the fact of how mad you are at whatever you're mad at. But those are some of the most irrational thinkings. You know, people make very bad decisions when they're angry. Same thing when you're hungry. Don't go to a grocery store when you're hungry. It's a bad choice. Yes, right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing with anger, which, which Freud talked about, is it um, spills over from the true target. So you, you end up being angry at everyone, but you're not really angry at them. It was something else that, that triggered the anger in the first place. So it becomes irrational in that sense. Yeah, and I guess you're right. So with, with happy emotions, you might like to save, savor them more. We don't like to savor our anger or our misery too much. Uh, well, hopefully most of us don't. But we don't ever really think to remember being happy. You know what I mean? Like when you're in the moment, you don't think to take account of it. You're kind of just like, we got get this is so much fun. We're at freaking Disney World. It never happens. Yeah, just enjoy it while you have it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, does it ever leave up bigger questions to you, I would say, when it comes to just, I mean, do you have any questions on conscious and unconscious, like things that maybe stump you or just answers that you would like to see unfold, you know, in the next coming years? Yeah, I mean, that, that's why I'm um, a research psychologist is um, my life consists of asking questions like that. And then doing studies to to see to see what you get. I mean, like we talked about, why are some people more hypnotizable than other? We, I mean, we don't know, but it's a really important and, and interesting question. Um, how how does this capacity to construct these these experiences that we see in the hypnosis case? How often is that applied in everyday life um, without us realizing it? Because you don't need a hypnotic induction to respond in this way people can just construct these experiences as they need them in, in any situation so how many experiences in everyday life are produced like produced like this this is something that um, we're working on um, what are the sorts of structures that can be learned unconsciously and we talked about language but we can't learn anything unconsciously um, you're going to have to learn your um, your algebra consciously for example so what what are the what are, what are the can be even more precise about the limits of unconscious learning? That's something I've tried to to grapple with. I think that has to. I think most of probably unconscious learning comes with games. Like sometimes I play something that might just seem like a like Assassin's Creed's a good example. That's the only reason I have an interest in Rome, ancient Rome, and Greek mythology. That and comic books that used to do like Hercules comics or something like that. You're learning as you're reading and it's in a fun way where you don't think that you're learning. It's kind of taking yourself out of that situation. That's why teachers play games. I think you learn more that way. I think there's a great way to, there's a great way to influence that in society. I mean, if advertising can do it, people, teachers can do it the same way with games. Yeah. I mean, the, the more you can structure learning as a set of games that you play, you're, you're keying into the to the natural process uh, that, that we evolved to have in order to learn, which is playing. Um, that's that's ideally how we should be learning. My my grandfather was a mathematics educator, and that's how he taught maths. He invented a lot of games for mainly primary school children to play, and they learned the maths by playing the games. Uh, and the children then enjoyed learning maths and learned some very difficult and complex maths. Uh, almost without realizing it, but they ended up knowing it uh, and knowing it in a very intuitive and solid way as, uh, as well. Whereas when you ask people just to sit down, be quiet and memorize this, you're, you're not using our um, the, the natural way we evolved. Sultan, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, man. Seriously, I really appreciate the time you've given me. Um, is there a place where people can find any of your links? Um, yeah, I, I've, I've uh, talked a lot about these and other things on. Um, in lectures that I've then YouTubed and talks that I've then YouTubed. So if you um, YouTube my name, Zoltan DNS, D-I-E-N-E-S, 
you'll 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 see um, a lot of talks that I've given. Okay, well, I'm gonna link it all in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, and thanks for listening to this episode. Out of the